I can just fit on a title slide. So I just want to acknowledge that up front that this is, I'm just a representative of this very large project. But all the same, I hope this, uh, this project generates some interest and generates some questions about where we're headed in terms of the exascale computers. So we start with a plot that a lot of us have seen before. This is a, a chart of just the top 500 supercomputing uh, systems in the world, ripped directly from the top 500 list. It shows here the uh, speed of the computer, the number one computer in the world at any given year, as well as the 500th fastest computer in every year. There's a few different things that are quite interesting about this plot. Uh, first of all that I see is that the gap between the fastest computer in the world and the 500th fastest computer in the world really hasn't uh, widened or changed very much over several decades of computing, uh, high-performance computing as we've known it. Uh, the second thing that's quite interesting about this plot is that it takes about 10 years for the speed of the number one fastest computer to become the 500th fastest computer. So that's sort of the delay, uh, delay time scale for when the highest high performance computing becomes commodity computing, um, if you consider commodity computing being still by the 500 fastest computer in the world. Um, if I were to superimpose on this plot, uh, the type of hardware that accelerates this progress, so which kinds of uh, specialty hardware is making these computers faster and faster, there was a, a period in the early 2010s where Intel and NVIDIA were fighting for their hardware on a lot of these really powerful supercomputers. But as you see, as we've moved into the late 2010s and, and now 2020 has shown us that uh, GPUs and specifically NVIDIA GPUs are actually becoming more and more popular uh, as hardware for our high performance computers. Of course, this is um, a colleague of mine, Steve Plimpton, sees a plot like this with these accelerator hardwares plotted on top of it as an extinction event for a lot of software uh, capability. And that seems a lot of doom and gloom, but what he, the sentiment behind it is that every time one of these new hardware architectures comes online, uh, researchers and software developers are forced to rewrite large parts of their code if they want to take advantage of that particular hardware. And that's really tasking for small research groups uh, or just anyone who doesn't have the time to completely rewrite their, their computational kernels for these new hardwares. There is an effort at Sandia National Labs where I'm at uh, to make that process a lot easier. This co Cocos abstraction layer, it's a type of programming language that will be compiled and work on any one of these hardwares. So you write the same code once in this particular style of templated C++, for example, and that gets compiled on and being used on all these different hardwares. Now, Cocos underpins a lot of the software progress that I'll show you today, but I am not the expert on it. Um, so, you know, this is something that I can point you to experts in the field of if that's something you're interested in, you have uh, ideas for your, advancing your software product onto higher performance computing machines. But again, I'm definitely not the expert on this, just here advertising for a bit of that. Now, that's sort of the mostly hardware, some of the software perspective in terms of where we're at in high performance computing. But really, as scientists, we need to be asking ourselves, are we actually taking advantage of this new technology in a sort of scientifically meaningful way? And back to Steve Plimpton's com comment about some of these hardware architectures be, being extinction-like events for some software products, how, what does that mean for what kind of science gets done uh, on these ever-increasing powerful machines? Is there certain fields or certain software products that are advancing and we're doing more science with those tools than we proportionally should be or would have been had we not been uh, changing up hardware and changing up the size of the computers that we're working on? So I want to use this theme to sort of promote where we're going with our software uh, stack uh, toward the exascale and try to be aware of enabling more science with the same tools, uh, just at larger scales. So being a molecular dynamics and density functional theory person, I sort of picked out a handful of examples of where we were at in terms of uh, petascale computers and the achievement that we had had on those machines. So the first picture that popped up was a quantum molecular dynamics simulation of over 10,000 particles of aluminum water. This is really outstanding work by uh, Shimuro and others, because this is sort of real scale catalytic activity uh, in materials and aqueous environments. So that really opened up a really large research area for that particular set of work and was really only enabled by the petascale machines that it ran on. Some other examples of really awesome science that came out of the petascale machines are uh, some work from Sharon Glosser and collaborators mapping out phases of granular systems or coarse grain particles, which was a really 
uh, a brute force whip search in terms of finding which, which uh, of these Korsgren particles um, materialize in different phases. Uh, the last two examples that popped up are actually two examples that ran using the lamps and molecular dynamics code that I work on. One of them uses coarse grain particles where a particle is now a, mole a whole molecule. Uh, that's the one in the bottom center. And those were scaled up to tens of billions of particles or tens of billions of molecules to study the mechanical response under high rate deformation. And then lastly is actually um, a very recent report in science, recent being just you know, two or three years outdated. Uh, about probably the biggest simulation that was run on any petascale machine. This is actually a all atom molecular dynamics simulation on tantalum, where they were straining a very, very large chunk of material. This is uh, over a billion particles. And they were straining that, straining this block of metal over and over again to study the limits of the material plasticity in the system. And they actually had to do this for many, many deformation cycles. So they actually were deforming this micron sized chunk of material, billions of atoms for billions of time steps. So in terms of total computational cost, they were running like 10 to the 18 atoms uh, time steps, which is in MD sort of the gold standard of how to estimate the cost of the simulation. And if you like that in more hardware numbers, this was actually run on a third of the uh, Blue Gene Q machine, Sequoia at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, it ran for a few weeks on that machine. So a few weeks of compute time on what was one of the largest petascale machines uh, of its time which when it was debuted was a 20 petaflop machine. So this, unless I'm a bit out of date on the literature, this is probably the largest simulation run uh, to date, at least in terms of total computational cost. So this is the kind of science, at least highlight level kind of science is happening on specifically only on the petascale machines. But what we really wanted to be looking forward as part of this project is what's possible for molecular dynamics at the exascale. So let's just take a hypothetical situation where we consider a 24 hour allocation on a leadership computing platform. Uh, if any of us are lucky enough to just snag 24 hours of 100% of the exascale machine, uh, let's pose the question of how to best spend that computational budget on molecular dynamics. As I mentioned previously, talking about the material plasticity example, MD computational cost is uh, uh, proportional to the number of particles you're simulating times the amount of time that you want to simulate. Both molecular dynamics in its best form is linear scaling, but the computational cost has to be multiplied by the amount of time that you want to be simulating as well. So that sets a sort of a linear trade-off in this uh, number of particles versus simulated time plot. Depending on the hardware that we're using, uh, we'll have to sort of scale back the total number of atoms that we could possibly run, but there's not sort of a free lunch of that linear trade-off in cost to uh, infinite number of particles or a huge number of particles. It's due to the memory restrictions of uh, the hardware because we have to not only track uh, particles where they are at, individual uh, particle properties, but as well as neighbor lists that keep track of atoms in the neighborhood so you can compute forces and, and do MD actually. The other restriction is actually uh, toward the simulated time axis. It dips down because you're more and more penalized by the rate at which you can communicate through the, the network of your supercomputer. Um, and the communication pattern of MD is such that you, know, you have to communicate the neighbor lists and particle, inner particle properties uh, semi, like at every time step. So there is a limit in the number of amount of simulated time ultimately you can run on a 24 hour allocation. Of course, if you're more patient, that simulated time can go out further. So if I were to put tick, bar, tick uh, marks on this plot based on sort of each generation of computing that has advanced um, over the last couple of decades. So each tick being sort of the pre-petascale, petascale, exascale, et cetera. What we actually see is that each generation of computing isn't advancing the simulated time that we're able to do as quickly as the number of particles that we were able to simulate. So which means there's sort of a, a feasibility envelope, essentially a problem, a science problem that you could have only done on that particular generation of computing. And it's uh, the feasibility envelope is quite large for the number of the particle increase that that new hardware gave you, but it's really quite small toward the simulated time axis. So if I were to put real numbers on those tick marks, uh, our current petascale machines for lamps per se is about 10 to the 12 particles. You can run that for a very short amount of time if you'd like. And if you're running a small system where you're uh, actually pressing against the communication restrictions of the machine in a 24 hour simulation, you can probably do microseconds of direct simulated time with MD, uh, all atom MD. If you're doing something coarse grain, that number moves uh, quite a bit. So really the question I wanna sort of 
push forward is um, how does this feasibility envelope restrict what kind of science, at least in the MD sense, which kind of science is done on these new computing platforms. So if we were to take the next generation computing, which is going to be the exascale computing, our hardware that we that's going to show up on those machines is really going to determine that uh, upper limit on number of particles. Uh, the GPU based machines are probably going to be safely, I can safely say they give you that three orders of magnitude increase in particle sizes. Um, memory per node is something that marches forward as well as the speed of the processor. But again, there's really not uh, much of a guarantee for advancement in the simulated time that we can do on a fixed allocation budget. So uh, let's get more into the details. If you actually have a problem that you want to run um, in MD, you first, you want to sort of determine uh, what's feasible in your budget based on sort of two things. First is being the length, length scale dependence of your simulation. So if you have if you, um, a length scale dependence of the physics of the problem that you're worried about goes as L to the alpha, the number of particle scales as that, versus the amount of time that you need to simulate to capture that physical process that you're interested in goes as T to the L to the gamma. So if we're to think about something simple, if we're doing like a bulk diffusion problem, that's L alpha is three and L, uh, gamma is two. So the slope sort of of that line through this feasibility envelope tells you if you're ideally in that linear trade-off regime where you can just do that same problem scaled up onto an exascale machine. If you're looking at sort of ballistic transport processes like shock physics, things that I'm particularly interested in, you have a linear dependence in time. So you actually are pushing is to scale your problem up to the exascale machine into that feasibility envelope, you're actually pushing really close to the number of particle limits in that of that particular system. Again, it's not everyone's problem to study the ballistic transport or even the diffusive processes. Like a lot of soft matter problems get used uh, are studied on high performance computers. But now you're sort of pushing to the other feasibility limit of the of the feasibility envelope limit, where you may have sub diffusive processes or really slow kinetics of the process that you're interested in, and now you're pushing into the regime uh, that's simulated time limited. But there's an entire class of problems that a lot of us are interested in that are almost always guaranteed to, to not scale well onto the exascale machines, which are things that are governed by rare event dynamics, things that have large activation barriers, at least on the, um, you know, on the few EV or less scale, which pushes their time scales way beyond what MD is capable of simulating. But these uh, algorithms and software stack that we are developing is part of this EXALT project, which stands for Exascale Atomics for Accuracy, Length, and Time, is actually giving you back the capability to scale your MD problems that are governed by rare event dynamics into a much larger um, envelope of feasibility space on the Exascale machines. So what I'm going to get into today is a bit about what our progress has been in terms of giving back the capability uh, to researchers to do long time simulations on exascale machines efficiently. But toward the end of the talk, and I think to this audience is gonna be most interesting, are these hypotheticals about um, what if you have different demands of the accuracy of your simulations? I'm guessing a lot of you can imagine that this feasibility envelope changes drastically in terms of the actual numbers on the uh, axes based on how accurate you want the simulation to be. Um, one of the things that we're taking advantage of in sort of the later years of this project is actually through machine learning, we're actually building up the capability to be ready to scale accuracy as sort of a continuous variable um, on the exascale. And also it's, a, it, it's almost a freebie because a lot of the algorithms we use for our machine learning already are scaling well on exascale machines so that at least the, the software development side is, um, is racing ahead of our capability side of how we're actually using machine learning to improve the accuracy of our simulations. So, sorry, it's morning for me, I'm still having my coffee. So the team is very large, as I mentioned previously. Uh, we have buy-in from a lot of uh, different um, national lab institutions here in the US, uh, places like Los Alamos National Lab, San Diego National Lab, where I'm at, Oak Ridge National Lab. But we also have um, team members from NERSC, which is sort of a a user for a high performance uh, facility that's uh, a user facility. So people write short proposals to get onto the NERSC machines. We have buy-in from those, from uh, people working at NERSC so that our software is made available to, as part of that user facility to people that want to use it. But we also have collaborations with NVIDIA. Uh, we have people like um, Evan Weinberg and a few others that are helping us uh, re-engineer our compute kernels that we use in MD such that they may take uh, the greatest advantage of the hardware that their, their company is putting out as well. 
If I were to give you a re-breakdown of the team in terms of where each of us contribute in the software stack, we have a handful of us at Sandia working on the LAMPS side of things. We have a um, linear scaling type binding code called Latte that's led out of Los Alamos National Lab that we're using as part of the software stack. Uh, also out of Los Alamos National Lab is a parallel uh, trajectory splicing algorithm. I'll get into the details of that in a, a slide or two. Uh, that's called Parsplice. We have a team of us working on machine learning potentials, which is on that third axis of accuracy. A lot of us are concerned about how we're, how we're scaling accuracy with our computing resources. And of course, we have uh, domain science experts uh, that are primarily led out of Oak Ridge National Lab, and I'll get into what those are in a minute. And then I have a whole lot of other people, but these are not to say that these are minority contributors. A lot of the people listed here are really doing the nuts and bolts software improvements to make sure our um, scientific capability matches the, the, the computing capability uh, at the exascale. So I'm not sure of the audience, but uh, let me just give a quick overview of like what's under the hood in terms of algorithmically how these improvements can take shape and make us uh, have exascale capable software. So for MD, parallelization is sort of, um, its parallelization is quite simple. It's a domain decomposition algorithm. So as Steve Plimpton would say, we're lucky enough to survive a lot of these extinction events because our parallelization is quite simple. It, it meets, it scales up with the hardware quite well. Because if you have a larger problem like the domain that's listed here, if you have more, more particles in your system, you could just simply put more cores, more GPUs and to distribute the workload further. And the only real trick to a lot of this is that for MD to happen, you need to calculate forces on the particles, call them atoms in this sense. And once, if the only way you can compute forces is by taking a look at the neighborhood of particles around you. And that's really the only thing you have to communicate across processors is which particles are nearby, uh, which particles are contained in nearby processors. And so if you can compute the forces based on particles in your neighborhood, you can update the atom positions through a velocity verlay algorithm and do that for all of time. Um, and then it's up to the user to figure out what that means scientifically, but in terms of actually boiling down LAMPS, a very large software project like LAMPS, it's for all time compute forces and update positions. It's a lot more under the hood, but for the sake of this, that's what it is. Parallelization in time is actually something not so intuitive or not so simply done uh, because the goal, especially in a rare event dynamic system, is to figure out how to generate one trajectory uh, that properly samples, in terms of a statistical mechanical sense, properly samples all of the states of the system in, in the correct thermodynamic proportions. And so the way we can do that in a parallel sense is not just have one simulation that you're waiting for a rare event to happen and throwing more and more cores at it until you can find the transitions between states, is that you can actually start running multiple replicas of the same simulation. And of course, the probability that you see that event goes up with the number of replicas that you have. But you can also, clever, if you're clever enough, you can start simulations in different states of the system and then just keep track of when you have crossings between states. And then you can sort of stitch or slice, splice together a trajectory that uh, connects all those different states. And that algorithm is that, that parallel trajectory splicing algorithm is actually what was uh, what is Parsplice, and the, one of the big software products that's part of the, the Exalt project. And there's a reference here, uh, but don't worry, I'm going to recollect all the references I've shown you throughout the, the presentation at the very end, so that you don't have to scribble down these references as quickly as I'm transitioning through slides. So a closer look at the parallelization in time that we're doing for our molecular dynamic simulations. The Parsplice code is actually all the things in this flowchart in, uh, in blue and green. And what it's actually doing is it's a task management software. So what it's trying to do is trying to manage a lot of resources uh, and it's to distribute them amongst tax, task managers. But it, there's also sort of um, a persistent database that it, it's also managing and communicating to the task managers. And that database is actually the statistics of which states you visited, how long you were visiting them. So the task managers can communicate that information to the database. The database can then be updated and redistributed to, to the task managers to try to generate greater diversity in the tr uh, splicing segments, tra tra trajectory segments that you've, that you've visited. So pictorially, the workers in each of these sense have you know, slightly different uh, basins that they start in. And underneath them are 
the simulation engines, the other parts of the, soft, the Exalt software stack. I sh I'm showing LAMPs and LATSE here, the type binding code. But in principle, uh, those computational engines can be, can be anything. Um, in a way, uh, they can be really, they can be, you can just have a few different workers that consume a large amount of the resources that you've been allocated. Or they could be very simple jobs, like things that take one core or less than one core, and you're just trying to manage thousands or tens of thousands of jobs with Parsplice to generate the, traje the long trajectory, the time accurate trajectory that you're interested in. Um, one of the main advances that we've been taking uh, as part of this is that instead of using LAMPS strictly as a computational engine to do MD, we're actually, uh, Steve Clinton has been, has been leading an effort to redesign LAMPS in a way that can act not as a computational engine, but just a glue layer so that uh, LAMPS and Parse Place have a special handshake that they do, and that's part of this project was um, developed. But we can actually use LAMPS as sort of a glue to another computational engine. So pictorially, it could be a quantum engine like Latte. We actually have bindings to NW Chem coming up soon. But if you're interested, um, LAMPS has, it's, um, there's a bit of software in LAMPS called the client server mode. So that means LAMPS can act as a client uh, to receive information from a secondary code just based off of like uh, memory, shared memory or through files of your on your file system. Or it could act as a server where it's hosting another like code to just live off of LAMPS and use the information that LAMPS is providing uh, to update you know, particles, a particle simulation, for example. Um, and so the, po the possibilities are quite large here. Uh, we think that you can do uh, mixed fidelity simulations advance my slide because I'm getting ahead of myself here. We actually envision this as sort of a means to do mixed fidelity simulations. So maybe the, the overall trajectory that you're interested in, the overall physics you're interested in that's governed by rare event dynamics can be sampled coarsely with like a simple inner atomic potential in MD, only infrequently switching such that you call a higher fidelity underlying model, like maybe a machine learned inner atomic potential or maybe something for first principles like a type binding or density functional theory result based on the state of the simulation that Parsplice is currently running. Um, that's completely possible. We can definitely do that. And it's enabled by Parsplice because Parsplice has a means to not just homogeneously distribute resources to all these workers, but depending on the flavor of the task uh, that each worker is doing, you can redistribute and reallocate a larger chunk of resources to that worker dynamically and then a smaller chunk of resources given the fidelity of the simulation that's underlying the, the worker. And so the problems of interest that we're, uh, that we're working on, or at least we're demonstrating with the Exalt package to begin with, uh, belong to uh, a really big challenge globally, which is the capability of sustainable fusion reaction. Uh, one of the main things that uh, limits fusion power is actually the, the degradation of plasma facing components. So the, the gold torus with the superimposed uh, doll, I guess there, is a, a schematic of the ITER reactor that's being built uh, nearer to you than me. Um, and then a zoom in is actually on the diverter region, the bottom center of the torus. And what we're seeing in these micrographs is that a degradation of the surface is growing on the order of milliseconds to seconds time. And that damage is actually due to helium being implanted in the simulation. So the diffusion of the implantation of helium, the diffusion of helium, the rupture of these helium bubbles, all of those things are rare event dynamics that really aren't well um, captured by MD timescales, even though this is a very much, very much a length scale problem that MD can tackle. So this is a really great problem for Exalt to, to be um, the Exalt project to be tackling. There were a few publications that we put out uh, early when Parse Place uh, was, we needed some demonstration problems. Uh, the, again, the references are there. I'll give them again at the, at the end. And then the the last pictures that popped up were actual MD simulations that were run as part of those simulations to, to just pictorially show you that the, the plasma facing surface problem in the micrographs is not too different than what we can capture in the, the MD simulations. Okay, so uh, in terms of like a progress report in terms of where Exalt is, the Department of Energy here in the United States keeps track of our progress through a figure of merit and this is really how well this is actually a figure of merit of how well the software is advancing onto the hardwares that are coming online. And so, as I mentioned before, MD's computational cost goes like the number of particles or atoms in the sense times the amount of time that we're running. And then 
the efficiency is you know, the per second quantity, how quickly we're doing those time stepping for those atoms. We do get an added boost from the parallel splicing trajectory where we can um, multiply the efficiency of the, at the time stepping algorithm times the number of replicas that we're running. So that's sort of each column in the flow chart of parse place. And our figure of merit actually uses a machine learning potential called SNAP, and I'll get into that in the subsequent slides. It uses a fairly large feature set of 205 by spectrum components. And what we've been doing uh, through time is just tracking how quickly we can run a baseline simulation with this machine learning potential. Uh, and really the progress is, is, is quite big. And I'm really sweeping a lot of details under the rug here, but I think I've sort of motivated uh, all the people and effort that's come behind this. So maybe I can just flash up a plot like this and say, we're actually meeting our figure of merit quite gracefully. We're actually scaling our algorithms to meet these machines um, ahead of schedule. And it's not just in terms of the single replica speed of molecular dynamics. We actually have really great strong scaling where we can push the size of a parse splice job to thousands of nodes, which means that thousands or tens of thousands of replicas that we're running in the system, which directly translates the length, the amount of time that we can simulate in those systems. And uh, more to come, of course. Also part of this project, we've been doing a lot of uh, core science development. Um, there's some new time acceleration methods that were being developed. So Art Voter, Steve Plimpton, Danny Perez have a new time acceleration method that is recently deployed and published. I don't have the reference, I'm sorry. Uh, recently deployed in LAMPS and published that is called hyperdynamics. It's based off this idea that um, you can locally bias a bond with um, a local bias potential. Um, and the time acceleration factor is actually proportional to the amount of boost that you're applying to each of those bonds. And it can be applied locally. So you can just apply this to any bond in the system. It doesn't have to be one bond per entire simulation. So the movie that's playing are add atoms onto a plat platinum surface where if an atom is vibrating and getting close to a transition to another stable point on the, on the surface, there's a boost of a, a bias potential that's applied that sort of gives it that extra kick to get over that transition to the next state. So with a 0.4 bias potential boost at 400 Kelvin, that means that every transition is sort of a 500 X boost in time. So you see the events 500 times faster than you would have otherwise, which gives you that time accelerate that time that's actually running in the top left of the movie. That's actually the, the real physical time of this system even though it's an all atom simulation, we're reaching half of a millisecond. And this was sort of a modest calculation. It's 2.4 million atoms total, which includes the substrate atoms. And uh, it was only run on 64 nodes of, of a strictly CPU machine run at Argon. Um, it was run in um, eight to 12 hours. I forget the exact number. So really not an exascale computer, not, we didn't need an exascale computer to reach half a millisecond of simulated time in this system. We'll also say that there's a histogram of particle sizes in the system at the, in the bottom right, which kind of shows you that with this bond boost, you're, re you're reaching the stable dynamics of the system quite quickly in just one MD simulation. Some of the other algorithmic improvements that are under the hood of this Exalt software stack comes in linear scaling type binding codes. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, linear scaling type binding is not necessarily anything new, but low prefactor linear scaling um, quantum algorithms are quite new. And the, the way we're able to do this within the latte code is actually doing what's called an extended Lagrangian born Oppenheimer MD uh, formulation. In short, this essentially means we're assigning an equation of motions to the charges of the system. So we don't actually have to restart from scratch the self-consistent field step at every uh, update in the atom positions. We can actually propagate the charges in the density matrix to the next step in MD which gives us a very, very low prefactor because the solution for the, the density of states is actually nearby the state that you've had previously. And if you have an equation of motion, you can use that as the starting point of the SCF. Um, so a lot of work that goes into this and uh, it's actually being quite promising for both the fusion energy problems that we're working on, but also just general material science in, uh, in general because we're reaching particle sizes in a type binding code that we're maybe just a few years ago thought impossible. So putting a number to it, we're doing million atom um, semi-empirical quantum methods. So it's quite impressive. It's a reference here, I'll show it to you again at the end. And one of the most important things that is a part of this algorithm is extended Lagrangian formalism is that it's 
uh, stable in time. It's a symplectic algorithm, so you actually don't cause an energy drift, which means you don't need to be applying a thermostat to make sure you have stable dynamics in the system. It's a very important factor of this, this uh, linear scaling MD. Okay, so with the remaining time I have here, which is 10-ish minutes, right? Um, a few more minutes. Um... Okay, so I spent a little too much time on the, the background stuff, but let me just talk about the machine learning and AI stuff that's happening as part of the Exalt as well. So as I mentioned before, the accuracy of our simulations is always something we should be considering in terms of not only just planning the budget for how we should be using our computational resources, but also just in general, we don't want to be um, undercutting the, the results that we're using because we wanted to use, just wanted to have a cheaper potential. So in MD, this essentially boils down to the inorganic potential model that we're using. For decades leading up to now, we've been using empirical potentials where we just use our physical chemistry intuition about the bonding of the material to write down closed form uh, energy and force expressions uh, of that system. Now, these are just obviously limited because if the material system doesn't strictly obey the functional form of the bonding that you're interested in, that you think is happening, then uh, really sacrificing a lot in terms of the, the overall accuracy of your system. So where the machine learning comes in is actually you, in a very data-driven sense, if you just make the assumption that all of the energies and forces can be captured as a feature set or a descriptor expansion of your atomic environment, then all, you, all that's left to do is just to generate a database of the correct answers, which come from a higher fidelity result, and then do some regression to correlate uh, those weighted feature vectors to the, the correct energies and forces that you can get. I'll skip through some of this because this is a story that I tell in a lot of different talks in that this is not a break from tradition. A lot of the advancement in interatomic potentials has been toward more expensive and more uh, uh, accurate interatomic potentials. And very recently, we were able to actually put hard data to these trade-offs between accuracy and cost. Um, there's actually a set of, of uh, databases on atomistic systems where we compare different machine learning methods. All of these are deployed in LAMPS, all the, the points on the right. And we actually are able to show that with, within any one method, you're able to scale the accuracy and cost trade-off, but you're also able to choose between a lot of different machine learning methods for the utmost accuracy, the utmost cost that you want for your system. Uh, of course, the objection is that these machine learning potentials aren't cheap and the empirical potentials, which even though they're not as accurate, are still faster. But honestly, we've made so much progress on the Exalt project through ECP that uh, we've closed that gap in terms of the, the efficiency of an emp empirical potential versus a machine, machine learning potential. And we have a few years left on this project and we have everyone and the, all the right people working on this to really make machine learning potentials the new gold standard for, for atomistic um, molecular dynamics. I'm gonna skip over this because uh, it's more perspective on how, the, how machine learning has bled into uh, molecular dynamics and just give you a few more highlights as part of the Exalt project where we're currently using it. So SNAP is a, a simple model in, in terms of machine learning sense. It's just using a highly detailed feature vector with bispectrum components in a linear or polynomial model to, to do regression on the, the, the energies and forces from, from the DFT. We could also, we could do better, of course, and this is actually with our collaboration at Los Alamos, is we're using those same feature vectors, the bispectrum components, into a highly nonlinear model as a neural network promises. And we, what we're showing here, the data in the center of the plot, is a, an expansion of the number of features that you're using in a snap, standard SNAP model, a linear model for this sense, with four to 10 um, angular momentum components, which goes from about 10 to 200 um, number of descriptors. And what you see is the accuracy is continuously improving with an expansion of the number of features that you're getting, but those are all with the linear model. And if you actually use the smallest feature vector length with a neural network formulation, you get the star at the bottom left, which means that the accuracy that you get in terms of the energies and force errors uh, on your database are much better than what you could have done even with a much larger feature set uh, in a linear model. And this is something we're taking advantage of and deploying in LAMPS. And the reason that we're able to do this is actually some code advancements in LAMPS that sort of open up the force calls to external programs. 
Uh, if you're interested in something like this, uh, there's a package in LAMPS called the MLIAP, stands for Machine Learning Interatomic Potential. I think Sivo, the next speaker, will actually talk a bit to uh, that code and how they're using it. But instead of LAMPS being the de facto force calculator MD um, engine, what we're doing is we're, we're thinking about LAMPS as more of a descriptor uh, calculator or a feature set calculator, and then offloading the calculation of forces to any external code. So right now we have couplings between LAMPS to PyTorch. And so we're able to um, calculate the, the feature vector in LAMPS, hand off the values of the feature vector for every atom in the system across all the processors and uh, return PyTorch will return back the evaluated machine learned model in terms of forces so that LAMPS can come back, do the time integration and do any other analysis that is in there. One of the interesting uh, uh, byproducts of opening up this force call to the external codes is actually we are able to train machine learning models, not just on the feature vectors, but on actually uh, the, the, the gradients of the feature vectors, which are important when you want to train to simultaneously the energy and the forces on the atoms. But um, more information, if, uh, if you're interested in that, I'll, I, I can provide some more information later on. All right, I'm going to skip over some of this. Uh, in order to close on a really important point that I'm involved in, uh, which is when we're considering machine learning models at the exascale, we're always going, we currently are very much bottlenecked by the availability of training data. Uh, to date, the best we can do is just have someone, grad student, myself, uh, run a lot of DFT calculations to assemble a training set, but that training set is intrinsically limited by sort of my creativity or the face face that I can, um, calculate a DFT calculation on. One of the ways that not just us, but a lot of machine learning practitioners in the world are tackling this is actually to uh, learn the correct model on the fly. So MD is a, is a simulation engine. It should be able to predict the next state of the system. If that state is not being predicted correctly, we can retrain and keep pushing forward. But one of the things that we're doing with uh, the Exalt package is to sort of make a twist on that learn on the fly algorithm where instead of using our parallel and time algorithms to splice together a, a time accurate simulation, we can use the parallel uh, parallelization of parse splice and exalt to actually find the new states of the system that we haven't been trained on before. And so this takes into the takes full advantage of the parallelization, the task manager parallelization that parse splice is giving us. It's also uh, taking full advantage of the heterogeneity that's allowed in each of the workers. So we can actually have um, our LAMP simulation engines finding new states of the system to train on. We can hand off those states of the system to different workers, different task managers that will run the quantum simulation to give us the high fidelity training data. And even further still, we can have a set of our resources devoted to a task manager and tasks that refit the potentials and hand them back to the, the LAMPS engine finding new states of the system. As a demonstration of this, we actually uh, devised a means to sample face space quite efficiently, because if you think about your database as has an information entropy about it in terms of all of the sets of descriptor, all the sets of feature vectors that are in it, you can determine if something needs to be retrained, whether or not it increases the information, ener information entropy of your database. And so we did this, we sort of uh, launched MD to try to maximize the information entropy in the descriptor space of tungsten, for example. Um, we actually ran, found 230 unique configurations, truly unique in terms of what their descriptor vectors are, 230,000 unique configurations and ran all of the DFT associated with those unique configurations in about 16 hours across 200 nodes on a strictly CPU machine at Argonne National Lab. We sort of see this as the new state of the art in terms of efficient generation of uh, training sets for machine learning potential in particular. But I'd love to hear from the audience of how they may take uh, advantage of something like this, the parallelization and parse place uh, to generate training sets for your machine learning problems as well. So all that to say that uh, a lot of the exalt effort is to not only enable new science at the exascale, but uh, not only be ready for the exascale computing hardwares, but uh, do more, enable more science at the exascale with our existing simulation software packages. Um, toward the end of this effort, we're spending a lot more time digging into the accuracy of our simulations through machine learning. And here are all those references. I'll also point you to a handful of uh, repositories on uh, GitHub and GitLab 
um, for either the entire software stack, which is Exalt, our fitting software for our machine learning potentials called FitSnap, but as well the, the sort of standardized databases if you want to compare your machine learning and your talk potentials to those that were published in that accuracy cost trade-off paper. Bit over time, happy to take questions. Thank you, Mitch, um, for the great talk. Lots of, for, uh, well, a very great overview of current and future efforts. Um, so let's open up for questions. We have about uh, seven minutes for questions. Um, please uh, write the questions in the chat or raise your hand. Um, okay, I will try to open the chat as well. Let's see. Yeah, okay. Ah, it was just a two minutes left warning that I conveniently ignored. See, any question from the audience? See. I think, um, yeah, so there is a question in the chat. Do you believe yeah. they trade on the flat potentials? Uh, good question, um, but an open question. Uh, what will be validating against? Um, the thing that pops into my head in terms of what we'd be validating it against is validating against a higher level of theory. So if you have a trajectory that's been um, on its own, just sort of doing a large trajectory segment and finds a new state of the system, the best way to validate that prediction is if you can take that state of the system and return it to a higher like DFT, uh, just checking sort of the energetics of the state, the forces on the atoms, that, that's the best thing that you could validate against. Um, it's harder to validate the question of should you have visited that state for that um, extrapolation of the machine learning potential. It's a harder thing to do. We have some efforts starting up now to try to figure out uh, ways to develop uncertainty quantification methods into parallel time algorithms to make sure uh, you have the right states visited as part of the, the machine learning model. but. Um, yeah, short answer is the best way to validate is if you can take the system back to DFT. The more elegant answer is if you could um, judge based on the, how far you're extrapolating whether or not you should have visited that state at all. There is a question by Steve uh, in the, he raised his hand. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, hi, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, all right. Uh, could you go maybe back to your, uh, slides about the extended Lagrangian uh, DFTB thing? Sure. Yeah, um, I think in the previous slide, uh, you had a, uh, no, that's bias potential. Okay. Uh, uh, there's, an, there's an animation, maybe that's why. Uh, yeah, that one. Um, this um, this looks to me a little bit like um, Carp Carpinello, right? So it does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, other other BUMD codes have something like wave function extrapolation to start from a better initial guess in the next. So do you know how does this compare to such an ap approach? Uh, no, I would be honestly, I'd be guessing as to how they could. Um, compared to that wave function projection method. Um, but if it helps, this the type binding code is, is really propagating the density matrix and not yeah. the wave functions themselves. So if I were to grasp at anything, what the difference was, it would be in that in the formulation of how the what what is being self consistently updated. It's the density matrix and not the wave functions. Oh, OK, OK, all right, thanks. There, there are a few questions in the chat. Um, one by Paul Baumeister. Um, he says, you are probably aware of pins, physics and form neural networks. Can you point out differences to your approach? Uh, I can point out a few similarities to the approach. Uh, physics inspired neural networks are things that enforce uh, certain physics as either in the network structure or in the, in the feature vector. At least that's my generalization of pins. Um, and as far as inner talk potentials go, our uh, descriptors are intrinsically rotation and translation invariant. So there's that base physics that 
the perspective of the simulation doesn't matter in terms of the energy and force of the system. But beyond that, we actually don't enforce anything special about the network architecture. Um, there is something interesting in the um, HIP neural networks, hierarchically, um, hierarchical something networks, these this pictorially represented here, where the structure of the network is that periodically you have interaction layers across um, multiple point centers of where the force is being calculated, but that's not exactly a, a strict physical intuition as to why that should be, be there. It just happens to be a nice ar architecture for this structure. Um, unless you have a compare, you were looking for a comparison to a broader pin that I'm not, I'm not sort of grasping at, but there is some base physics based built into our, our neural networks, if that helps you, helps answer. Um, so there's another question in the chat by Fadwa. Um, asking, is Cocos for SNAP available on the current LAMPS release? It is, very much so. Um, Cocos compilation of LAMPS will get you on GPUs and other Intel accelerator hardware. Um, there's actually some build instructions using CMake to enable Cocos. And it's not Cocos just for SNAP. If you build LAMPS with Cocos, you get all of the, the different interaction models, all the different pair styles and integrators that are Cocosified. Uh, so yeah. Um, LAMPS documentation page has information on how to compile with Cocos. It's, um, it's only slightly harder to do than a standard make of the system, but I think a lot of those hurdles are broken down by the new CMake integration that we've been doing with LAMPS. I'm just quickly reading the next question. Uh, it's by Siva, uh, the next speaker and your colleague. <laughs> you talked about the narrowing gap between ML methods and non-ML methods. Where mm -hmm. would you invest your time, effort, money? Uh, <laughs> um, honestly, there's a lot of work to be done in, in a lot of our GPU acceleration is specific to the bispectrum components that we're using. I think as a community service project, or like not a community service project, I should rephrase that as an open source software, LAMPS accepts a lot of different machine learning models, but a lot of the GPU acceleration right now is really specific to the bispectrum components that SNAP uses. Um, if we were to make this sort of more broadly usable, we should probably start focusing on uh, writing different uh, feature vector calculation kernels using Cocos so that they are also GPU accelerated. A point worth making is that the um, accuracy cost comparison plot that I showed and is published in the journal of computational physics or uh, chemical physics paper, excuse me. Those are all uh, single CPU core timings because a lot of these different machine learning methods are not GPU accessible yet. So I think that's that's a growth area that I think um, maybe not myself, but I think is worth spending money on. And the final question uh, by Ben Wu, how, um, how can the time parallelization be achieved for mechanical deformation of a metal, for example? Uh, I don't know, because it depends largely on the metal that you're interested in. Um, in FCC metals, as you're probably familiar, you know, most of your deformations through partial partial dislocation migration. And those things have really low barriers on the order of like uh, thermal activation barriers that they're able to, to slip. And so parallel time algorithms don't work very well for systems that have really low energetic barriers because the more times you have to reassess how many different states you've been accessing with how, with how many different residence times, um, the parallel, parallel and time algorithm actually starts slowing down if you have too many transitions. So Mechanical deformation is tricky because you have a mix of really high barriers, like say those associated with fracture propagation, but also a lot of low barriers that are associated with like dislocation and slip activity. So open question, but I don't think it's impossible to, to think that we could do those problems with parallel in time MD. All right. So, well, thank you very much again, Mitch. It was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, I think we also thanks for answering all the questions. Uh, there are quite a bit, quite a few. So um, yeah, if uh, a few more minutes. Um, yeah, I I can make these slides available if it's something that uh, you guys as organizers want to redistribute. Um, that would be great. I really want to really want to point people to the repositories yeah. that we are working with, and as well, there's some contact information for myself and the PI of this project, Annie Perez. That would be great if you'd like to share the slides uh, with us please uh, go ahead and, and send them to us. Um, thanks again. We Thank have you. Minutes.
And then we'll have the next talk by Siva coming up at 6 p.m. <laughs>